Good afternoon. I am Valérie Verdalevi, Instituto Marangoni London School Director. Instituto Marangoni is one of the top educational choices uh, for creative in the design areas. We school in Milan, Firenze, London, Miami, Dubai, Mumbai, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. We are very pleased to welcome you this afternoon for the talk, and uh, we are very pleased to have partnered with London Design Festival and the uh, Global Design Forum, and its November talk. Uh, this curated program has been conceived like a platform. Today, we're going to focus on materials and how we can create longevity through material choice. Thank you to our incredible uh, guests, ladies first, so Caroline Thiel, five so good, and Marco Gemper, and thanks, uh, thank you also to our chair, uh, Joanna. So we wish you to enjoy the talks, and if you want to know more, do not hesitate to follow us on Instagram, Instituto Marangoni London. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, we're here today to talk about the subject of material narratives. Um, and my name is Johanna Agerman-Ross, and I'm a curator here at the V&A. I look after the collection of 20th century in contemporary furniture and product design. And this uh, theme of material narratives is very close to my heart, as I, since earlier this year, lead a new program here at the V&A called uh, make Good, Rethinking Material Futures. Uh, this project is a 10-year-long project uh, supported by John Makepeace, a furniture maker and designer, uh, and it explores the use of renewable natural materials um, and also looks at the idea of sustainable forestry within design and architecture. So this idea of material narratives is something that we're very interested in here at the V&A at the moment. Um, we also opened a show in V&A Dundee a few weeks ago on plastics. So indeed, materials uh, are at the forefront of our thinking and doing when it comes to contemporary design practice. Um, and uh, investigating this theme of material narratives today, we have, uh, as was already introduced, uh, Caroline Till, co-founder of Franklin Till, a futures research agency, working with global brands and organizations to activate design and material innovation for positive social environmental change. Uh, and she was also previously uh, directing the Material Futures course at Central St. Martins. Then we have Martino Gamper, uh, in the middle, uh, a designer and furniture maker uh, who has run his studio here in London since the early 2000s. Um, Martino is recognized for his constant pursuit of developing new materials along with repurposing of existing materials in his work. And he has had exhibitions at Serpentine Gallery just up the road. And he has also previously led one of the platforms of the Design Products MA uh, courses at Royal College, also up the road. And finally, right next to me, you have Faye Toogood, uh, who runs a studio that encompasses interior design, homewares, fine art, and fashion. Um, in fact, she refuses to be constrained by a single discipline or defined by a way of working, and instead describes herself as an outsider whose work defies categorization. Um, this can most recently be appreciated in a, a book of Faye's work called Faye Toogood, Drawing, Material, Sculpture, Landscape, which is published by Fiden. So thank you all three for, for joining this, uh, this afternoon even. It's only Monday afternoon and I already forget what time of day it is. Um, so I thought the format of this afternoon's talk uh, would be for each of you to just give a little quick overview uh, of your work and your interests in the field of material narratives. We will then have a little conversation, and then it's also over to you to ask questions. So um, do have a think about the questions you'd like to ask this illustrious group of three. I'm, I'm sure they're all up for difficult and intriguing questions. Um, so I think without further ado, I hand over to you, Caroline, to start. Thank you. Amazing. I'm going to just shift back because I feel like I'm under an interrogation light. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see if this clicker's going to work. Oh, no, it's all gone. Hello? Keep going? No? 
Charlie at the back. Is there any presentation slides? Yep, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Caroline Till, co-founder of uh, Franklin Till. We're a futures research agency. And actually, normally at this point, I say my mum's been asking for the last 12 years that we've been running, what is it that you actually do? But I can't say that today because my mum's in the audience. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, which she's not normally, by the way, she doesn't follow me everywhere I go. <laughs> um, anyway, so back to the point. Yeah, so we're a futures research agency. Effectively, um, we specialise in supporting um, design and material innovation. And we really want to support our clients, which are major brands and organisations, to um, build together a future in which people and planet can flourish collaboratively. And um, note that I don't use the word sustainability, but perhaps we can talk more about that later because it's a bit of a problematic word. Um, we, the heart of our work is about the role of material developing that future in which people and planet can flourish together. Um, and so really we amass research and disseminate it in a variety of ways. Um, we edited the book Radical Matter and uh, published with Thames and Hudson in 2018, really as a call to action for the design industry, um, saying, you know, materials are the the building blocks of design, we need to think and understand more deeply where they're coming from, the point of extraction, how we're transforming them and, you know, where they go at end of life or indeed how we send them on to their next life. Um, and so we wanted to celebrate lots of kind of small scale designer makers that were doing just that um, and say, you know, let's really have a conversation more deeply about materials. Um, we also edit a magazine um, called uh, Viewpoint Colour, which explores the deep relationship between colour and material, and really uh, looking at the, the sustainability trajectory and, and, and where that's heading in relation to colour and material innovation. Um, as an example, we do, um, we're really interested in, I guess, uh, demystifying sort of complex ideas, particularly in relation to materials. We've done lots of collaborations with organisations like the Centre for Circular Design, which is part of University Arts London. Um, and this was a feature in a recent issue called Afterlife, and we were addressing circularity. Um, we know that's a term that's broadly used within the design field, but we find even within some of the, the largest corporates, they don't actually know what that means, and they don't know how to achieve it. So we're really interested in sort of demystifying and using the seduction of design to make things feel more accessible and more inspiring. Um, so Afterlife was really saying... Circularity is really about designing the end at the beginning and creating, working with a photographer to create a visual narrative to, to go with that. Another example was um, uh, more recently Material Ages, where we worked with Professor Kate Goldsworthy to disseminate her ideas that actually we have had these three major Material Ages since 6000 BC, where we, you know, we've, uh, in the, until the start of the 21st century, um, we were really working with sort of naturally based materials um, in, in their original form. Then in the 1950s, we exploded into the age of synthetics. And she's really saying that actually what we need to very quickly move into is the age of, um, uh, the age of recovery, where we're working with waste streams, we're recovering and looking at um, new um, material fiber innovations. Um, we work with... We love actually working with some of the world's largest companies because we feel, rather than being the villains, that's where we could have most impact. So um, this is just an example of um, one of the deep projects we have with a major sportswear brand. And we deliver packages of research, but then often help them to actually unpack what does this mean and how can we activate that with you? So we build what we call sort of platforms for innovation that are long-term projects that we often pairing designers with material scientists or really sort of um, supporting their internal teams with new knowledge um, to help them shift forward in terms of their processes um, and their product lines. And along the way, we're asking difficult questions as well, like, you know, really, you've got too many product lines. And um, so, you know, we, we'd like to be quite provocative. Um, the role of, of communication and making, as I said, that word seduction is quite important. Um, we are sort of really love working with companies like Tarquette. Um, some of you may well have heard of them, a, a carpet company 
who are, I'd say, one of the most convincing in terms of their circular infrastructure. Um, they've got an incredible take-back scheme, an incredible uh, way of designing for disassembly, but they communicate in a very technical way. It's very unsexy. Um, so we're helping them to really tell the story so that people can just, by visuals, start to understand more deeply their system. And then finally, I just wanted to mention um, a more sort of public-facing project that we've worked on in the last um, two years. We've been deeply collaborating with the Barbican, um, and we were the guest curators for a major exhibition called Our Time on Earth, um, which was open at the Barbican. Some of you might hopefully will have caught it over the summer. It closed at the end of August and is just um, in a shipping container off to Canada um, and will be touring the world for the next five years. So going to Quebec, then North America, and then into Asia and back to Europe. Um, and it was a dream brief, um, you know, somebody coming and saying, uh, would you like to curate an exhibition about climate emergency? <laughs> yes, please. Um, and really, we wanted to approach this with our core studio philosophy as optimists to say, um, you know, we want to celebrate the role of design, materials, of art and culture in, um, you know, the role that we can play to combat climate emergency and take a really positive stance. We started by saying we are living beings within a living system. And isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing and awe-inspiring? Um, and then we're trying to really tell stories of how we can uh, live in symbiosis with the natural world and how design um, particularly is enabling that. And there was a big emphasis on, because often when we talk about materials, there's an emphasis on tangibility. But, you know, obviously, um, explosion of, of digital technology is, is a, an important role as well. So we were often using technology to tell stories of the natural world to, um, you know, with emphasis that if we know more about our biosphere and the in deep interconnection that we have with it, we can hopefully care more. So we had works in collaboration with people like Marshmallow Laser Feast um, that were showing the inner workings of a tree and basically conveying that what's going on within a tree is the same as what's going on within a human body and that we're deeply interconnected. Um, and there was a beautiful uh, anecdote and really lovely. I did a lot of schools tours and I think that was one of the, the highlights for me. And I, I remember a six-year-old boy stood in front of this tree and said, but hang on, trees aren't alive, they don't move. And that was a really kind of awe-inspiring moment where you thought, wow, there's some impact we can make here. And we had a really ended up with a beautiful conversation with his class where they were saying, oh, so like a forest, there's more going on in a forest than there is like a car park. Um, and just this understanding of what, you know, what it is to be alive and that our materials are dynamic. They're, you know, they start often from living systems. Um, we also were talking about the importance of looking backwards to go forwards um, and the celebration of um, uh, deep indigenous wisdom and connection to our natural world. Um, and then, for example, looking at some sort of future provocations in collaboration with Biofabricate. Um, this was exploring a future in which clothing is biologically grown as opposed to industrially manufactured. Um, and then exploring the kind of fundamental matter on which all life depends. This is in collaboration with um, uh, George Monbiot um, in his recent book, Reg uh, Regeneration, looking at the story of soil, um, and in collaboration with Helician, the digital agency. So really using technology to take you six foot below the earth to understand the teeming life that's going on within soil so that we can hopefully learn to appreciate that actually, you know, all living things on earth are dependent on this, this fundamental substrate. So hopefully through sort of telling these stories, people could feel that sense of interconnection. I think that's it from, from me. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass on. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. We will hand over to you, Martina, and Charlie, we're asking for the next presentation, please. Yeah. Um, cheers. So this is a project that actually goes back to the V&A somehow. So back in 2002, I was asked to take part in the village fete that used to be out in the courtyard. And with a friend of mine, Rainer, we... Um, we were collecting broken furniture from the streets of London. We'd take it to the V&A, 
in bits, we dis disassembled it, and then we would put it back together again, and people could choose which piece they ever wanted, and we would make ad hoc furniture for them. And we call it furniture while you wait, a bit like a cobbler in a station. And um, so this was kind of um, an early, um, we thought it was actually just a fun project. We didn't really think as designers we, we could ever, would ever do this, and we would ever be taken serious in a way. And um, from our point of view, at least it was successful because a lot of people, we got rid of all the material. Everyone took a piece of furniture home for very cheap. And we did it the year after again. And somehow, what, what I really kind of enjoyed kind of in the process was that there wasn't actually, um, I didn't have to convince anyone, a company, to uh, convince that that chair was particularly um, better or more interesting than another. Um, there was an um, act of spontaneity, you know, it was kind of ad hoc. So it was instant gratification as a designer. You, you see something, you make it, that's it. Okay, so um, I decided at one point, because I kept collecting chairs, so I decided to make 100 chairs in 100 days. Um, really, as, as a research project, so it was really something that um, wasn't meant to be a product, it wasn't meant to be for, for people necessarily to have in the house, it was purely for me to understand what the chair what a chair could be, um, to understand about the material, what other people had designed by taking something apart in you know, individual bits, that's what the chemists do. You know, they take, they take the world into bits and they reassemble it again. So you learn about other, other designers' uh, ideas, thinking, quality of design, quality of materials. And uh, so yeah, go back, come back. So yeah, so... Um, that project then um, got exhibited actually down the road in Cromwell Place, and it's been touring since then, kind of as, a, as 99 chairs, because the 100 chairs I make every time I go to a place. But really, um, I didn't even expect that it would um, really uh, be part of the conversation about sustainability. Um, it was a project that just inspired me. I, it was the materials I could find on the, on the streets. It was what I could do at a particular time. But obviously, it suddenly, um, back in the early, it was 1997. No, 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 2007, sorry, I didn't say. <laughs> sorry, no, 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 sorry, it's 2007. And it obviously f um, started to kind of um, start a new conversation about, about how we use materials and how do we actually deal with, with existing furniture, with old furniture, um, the stories related to, the, to each piece, and so on. Um, and, and, and kind of continuing from that, I, I started investigating more and more the idea of reusing material. So um, in this instant, then, um, I w I'd been given these um, furnitures from this hotel in Italy called Parco dei Principi in Sorrento, that was designed by a very famous Italian architect, designer, Gio Ponti. And for some reason, they wanted to redesign their rooms, and they sold all the you know, sold all the materials to a dealer who then um, initially only wanted to give me one one or two pieces and then um, but it was somehow for me interesting to see that it didn't have to be a new material it didn't have to be a new material to be to be to, that I could be be creative um, and somehow the limitations of the materials created another another level to it so it wasn't something that was going to be re remade but again it was a research for me it was something that I could um, work that I could assemble so these are basically doors of uh, cupboard doors that had one side white and one side green to cross color laminate so um, and somehow um, I kept continuing with this, I kept continuing making furniture with trying to find materials. Material was offered to me at one point, because people realized, oh, I have something, I don't know what to do with it. I don't want to throw it out. It might be a heirloom piece, it might be something that uh, was designed for a particular space. And so yeah, so the journey continued. But what I really enjoyed as well as a creative was that um, there wasn't necessarily a translation from uh, from my idea to a piece of paper, white piece of paper that we all sit in front of, you know, every day and go like, I'm going to start designing a chair. Uh, what is the, what's the context here? What am I trying to achieve? So it was actually straight on to the, 
the work. So it felt like I was jumping, over jumping one, one translation from the paper back to the piece. And that's something that taught me a lot about um, um, mismatching material, collaging, and so on. So it, somehow I invented my own language, but also my own techniques, and uh, that I thought was very needed in a way for me, because I, I had worked in design studios before, and I found it very difficult to design yet another product that yet another time would maybe be almost uh, be fully designed, but then at the last moment it wouldn't be manufactured because of one of the other reasons. So it was kind of very frustrating as well. And uh, yeah, this was actually a performance in Basel where I've actually live performed cutting those pieces up. Um, so in the background, you can press and press in. So this in the background, this were the headboards. Um, this was this was a chair that I didn't touch because uh, it's part of the other furniture. Neither this one, but this was the result of cutting up some of this and this. So I didn't really know when I was starting what I was going to make. It was just like there's a saw, there was a cut, and then it was kind of continued steps of going backwards again. And um, jumping way 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 ahead now, this is a project I showed this year in Milan at the furniture fair, and. Um, I'd been. Um, I found this this um, tubular furniture in um, from a dealer ten years ago, and I've been storing them since ten years ago. They were all designed and made by a company called Cox Furniture, who back in the 30s and 40s, in post-war, was a really big British um, tubular steel producer. They would design. Um, initially, started off with with um, chairs for cars. Then they will go into hospitals, schools, and so on, and public kind of offices, and also domestic. And um, some of them were prototypes, some of them were production pieces, and, and don't know too much about it. They were kind of sold off by a member, member of the family probably 15 years ago, and then ended up in my warehouse. But I really wanted to kind of re rework them, so um, I started with the idea of, of grafting. So I basically Crafted, crafted this, this, this pieces of um, new language onto it. So I, I cut them and I added something that was for me a new language. That um, and there again there was something for me as, as a designer. I'm realizing that it's we don't have to constantly rent the wheel. There is something there we can add to it. We can change it. We can modify it. We can. Um, um, yeah, um, change the, the way a piece of furniture feels just by changing a little part of it, not necessarily by chucking it out and starting again. And also the fabric was the designed, uh, I designed the fabric and it was um, woven with French wool. It seems to be quite difficult to actually find French wool, mm -hmm. mostly as New Zealand and Australian wool. Um, but it was it was designed without using a dye, so it was just using natural the natural coloration of sheep, so white, brown, black. They're not really black; they're kind of dark, dark brown. Um, yes, and yeah, that's it. How oh, this was done, the presentation of it. Thank you. So on to next phase. Thank you. Um, my slides are yeah here. Um, so as um, as was mentioned, I work across um, furniture, objects, um, sculpture, and clothing. Um, I try not to call, call myself a designer. I call myself more of a, a tinker. So try and imagine somebody in a shed, collecting things and playing around with things and um, coming up with new <laughs> new ideas. I think most of my um, design career has been spent the last 15 years really playing around with materials, perhaps not always consciously knowing what I'm doing. But um, here, the connection that I have with materials is really fundamental for me to help tell stories, to tell narratives. Um, it brings me closer to um, the landscape, which for me is a really important part of my inspiration. 
So um, a lot of the time I'm actually using materials that perhaps a child would use. So a paint pot, um, a ball of clay, um, some wire, some wool, things that I find around my studio. They're often the starting points. Um, on, on this slide particularly, I wanted to note the um, charcoal. I guess that the essence of charcoal here is quite important to me. So perhaps using charcoal to draw, to paint, um, to fill a, fill a glass bowl, um, the idea of charcoal being used to paint across the clothing. We do um, a lot with our clothing that's trying to push the boundaries of materials and clothing. So when I started making clothes, like probably about 12 years ago, we were making things out of um, bin liners and old, um, old materials that we found that were not traditionally apparel materials. So it's this idea of testing um, what we can actually wear and how we, how we wear them and how we use them. Um, so it's kind of gone on, you know, when I went on to make clothes out of um, old cling film um, and things that I had found, some masking tape and things that were not normally used for apparel. Although from a sustainability point of view at that time, I don't think I was thinking about that. I was thinking about questioning questioning materials and how, how we use materials in work. So here for me, this is a lot about water. So being connected to water um, is an important part of my life and the way that I look at things. So this transparency. The roly-poly chair that I think has become quite a symbol for me has also been um, a shape that I've been able to rematerialize. So here it's in cast glass and sometimes it will appear in mud or um, in cast in fiberglass or um, Driade has done a version in plastic and I've spent the last five years pestering them to think about recycled plastic, which now they're starting to do. So this idea of materials here, the woodland and the closeness to nature and clay, a lot of what I start working with, as you were explaining, is not a drawing. I never start with a drawing. It's always with model making. So it's, it's with the actual material itself um, to create the shapes. A lot, of, a lot of clay, as I said. So when we started the fashion collection, um, we didn't have hundreds of meters of cashmere. My sister and I only had access to painted canvas. So we then screen printed it, hand painted it, sprayed rubber onto it. We found different ways of translating that canvas. Um, sometimes instead of using plastic buttons, we use little clay buttons that we make in, in house. Um, so it's just this pushing of boundaries with, with materials that's been quite obsessive for me. Um, and it's allowed me to create my, my own narrative. Thank you, Faye. <laughs> so I thought we start with a very broad and open question, but it's one that you all touched a little bit upon in your presentations. Um, really, how important are the materials that you choose and that you work with in shaping the narratives of your work and shaping the narratives of your projects? And I'm thinking maybe we start with you, Caroline, because you're the least kind of designer-led in, in, in this um, group. Um, I mean, I guess material is kind of everything we do, but but not necessarily in the literal that we're manipulating material sense. I guess we're sort of interested in everything around that and and really exploring you know what how we're interacting with materials how we have been and how how we need to think about them as we go forward so um yeah i think it, it's kind of everything we do but we're not necessarily manipulating them ourselves and i think what we find if i think of the teams that we work with again you know in in large corporations that are actually very very uh distance from the physical materials that they're working with. You know, I think from um, Faye and Martina have had beautiful examples of, of very, you know, hands-on processes and being deeply connected. And the problem that we have with more mass manufactured goods is that we're just not working in that way. And, you know, really designers, I see, you know, worked in many years in education and students becoming very quickly specifiers more than anything else. And, you know, sitting in 
boxes in huge fractured companies kind of making decisions on a daily basis about material but not being fully equipped with the information to be able to make you know perhaps good enough decisions for both the environment and for the people that are going to be wearing or using this thing so I guess that's the role that we feel we play is to help them to be more connected to the reality of that information because they're not manipulating that material with their own hands. They are generally, you know, specifying something overseas. And and it's very easy to become, you know, very disillusioned and also not to have the information that you need or, or be unaware of the huge interconnected, you know, life cycle of the products that they're designing. So for us, I guess, we want to feed them with that information but in a way that makes them feel connected again and makes them feel inspired not you know there's amazing organizations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that are working to enable people to have information about circularity but it can be in quite a sorry if anyone works at Ellen MacArthur if I'm being a bit provocative but it can be in a very uh, systems diagram led way and you know the reality is designers are you know, visual and tactile people. And if they're not given this information in a way that relates, that they can relate to and they can, you know, actually apply in their work. So, yeah, I guess that's where we see our role. And Martina, you spoke about very hands-on working of materials there and, and materials with long histories in themselves, Geopontis furniture, for example. So, yeah, how important are materials for your narrative? I'm always looking for materials, but um, I guess a material without a story is nothing. A material without a narrative it's, it doesn't really, you know, or without a shape, it's just it's a material. So I guess it's, there's always a combination of a material, a process, a story, and the use and the function. So I think that those are, the, the, for me, design has to be covering all those parts in a way. So it's. It's not just one thing. It's just not the sh not the shape itself. It's not the material itself. Neither is it is it just a narrative. And I think that's what I think you have to be really these days really be careful about. You see a lot of greenwashing where either the story is green, the material is not green, the material is green, but the the way the, it's used is not it's not green or not kind of looked at. So I think when we talk about you know materials and the way that we use them and abused him. I think it's important that it's a, it's a circle in a way, and it's not just one thing cut out of it and, and by itself, because then we easily find a feeling of, uh, fall into this trap of, oh yeah, it's this material, it's great, no? In the same way that plastic is not just the only evil thing, you know, it's like, so it always depends. What do you make out of it? <laughs> What's the lifespan? You know, where does it end up? What's the function? But how do people relate to it? And how is the story, the narrative, um, make people want to keep it and 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 live with it? And how much do they treasure it? So I think there's a lot of, yeah, yeah the material is just one part of it. But it's important in my work. I mean, I'm always looking for materials contextualizes. So Faye, what about for you? Yes, I think. Um, as Martina was saying, it's absolutely, it is often the starting point. For me, it is the starting point. The materials library in my studio, I nickname it the jewellery box, because essentially, you know, it's my favourite place. It's the place that I go to when we start a project. And what, what I really enjoy is looking at materials across interiors, um, clothing and furniture. So kind of playing with that, which ones can I move from one to another? Um, and I think, you know, when I was putting that presentation together, I realized that a lot of the time I've been questioning the value of behind materials. So certainly when we started working in furniture design, there were a lot of people working in um, marble and brass and, you know, high value materials. Um, and so I think I've probably spent quite a lot of time questioning the value of material and questioning our perception of the value of materials. Um, we all understand the difference between a... Two ninety-nine pound chicken and a thirteen fifteen pound chicken, but do we really understand the difference between where that is made and this is made, and the value behind that particular material? And I think it's a lot of it is is us educating how much how much it actually costs us to make a really 
beautiful product that will have longevity, where we paid people properly and the material's been made in the right, fair way and the processes have been done as they should. And, and that does come with a price tag, which is always the fight, I think. You know, when you're a designer, you want to make your work accessible as possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the roly-poly chair, you know, sometimes the cast glass one, you know, that's in museums, but the, the plastic version was meant to be for everybody. Um, it was the only way that I could get something out at 400 euros, giving it to a, an Italian manufacturer to reproduce. Um, but, you know, now we have these great debates about the relevance of that plastic chair. And it now comes in recycled plastic, but it only comes in black. So we, as consumers, need to start to be aware we can't have everything, you know. We can't have all, we can't have it the way that we used to have it when it comes to materials. The, the availability shouldn't be there. We've, we've now got unrealistic expectations, so you can't have it in 10 colors, but you can have it in black, recycled plastic. So it's, we all have to learn that um, our perception of materials has to change um, if we're going to re readdress it, really. And you'll speak there of kind of, well, the values we put on materials, but also how we as both consumers, users, makers, designers, manufacturers understand that value. Um, where, where do you, to keep yourself, where, where do you go to keep yourselves more informed of the materials you use? You know, so in the case that you brought up, Martino, these are secondhand pieces that either you found on the street or um, that, that have come from a collection, but in other cases, such as the one that you're talking about, Caroline, they are sometimes completely new materials that we know very little about, uh, or um, materials that are reconsidered or rethought, like you're talking about, Faye. So where do you go to kind of inform yourselves of what is on the horizon, and where do you get that information from? And something that I think we could all learn from. I mean, I think we're quite lucky in that we edit magazines, so often information comes to us. And um, so that's quite a sort of privileged position to be in this concert. And I guess we're researchers, so that's what we do on a day to day basis is just looking outward. And again, that's what we find our role is to lots of companies that they just don't give the time or emphasis on R&D. They're so focused on rolling out deliverables. So we often are you know, providing that sense of research and, and inspiration. But I guess, really, um, students, higher education, always had, you know, from my years of running Material Futures to constantly remaining connected with the academic community, um, not just in design, but other disciplines as well. So I think having that connection of, um, I mean, there's nothing like standing in front of students to, to level you and <laughs> to make you feel a bit redundant and old <laughs> and um, as well as, you know, having young kids and what they're doing and interested in. So, yeah, I would say probably education um, and academia is a, is a key sort of stimulus for us. Martina? Curiosity killed the cat, no? <laughs> no, I mean, you have to be curious. I think as a designer, you're generally curious about, about what you... Generally, what you you know we looking for. So, but um, I do have a list that a list of ideas and a list of materials, and uh, I just write things on it. It's in, my, it's in one of my sketchbooks, and sometimes I try to then put things together. You know, these materials could work with this idea and so on. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, it's a it's a constant kind of yeah searching for. New ways of doing new work, not just materials, but also new ways of doing things. Because um, there's a lot of materials that have been invented in the last 10, 15 years, but somehow they still go back to, they're not completely new. Mm. You know, there is a lot of things that have been growing, more, more materials have been growing, but somehow they're related to other processes and other materials again. So. Because at the end of the day, I think that's just, you either remove materials or you add materials. That's the two ways you can manipulate any object. And, you know, by removing, it's basically you get a big piece and you take it away, you sculpt away. By adding, you assemble it, you grow it. You So those are the two ways. Big piece, taking away, small piece, adding. <laughs> so, and that's the whole category around, you know, around that and, and yeah. 
Mm -hmm. You talked about your materials library or jewellery yeah. box. How do you add to that? Um, so often it is, yes, found found things that I, you know, somehow I've picked it up or seen it or collected it. Um, and so a lot of them are sort of pre-made objects. They're not necessarily materials from um, a, a company, per se. And so I think it's sort of, again, it brings up the questioning of how that's made or how... And I think your link to manufacturing is that exactly right. So you can find the material, but you also have to find the manufacturing. Um, one of the um, brilliant collaborations I did was with Birkenstock, and they're still making, obviously, their Birkenstocks with natural materials in the same way that they've been doing for the last couple of hundred years. So it's, it's for me, I think I'm spending the time now looking back so I look a lot at antiques, and I'm doing them quite a lot with wood. And I think trying to find as many local materials as I can and local manufacturers as I can. So I, I tend to scour this country before I move out. So mills in Lancashire, trying to use as many you know beautiful wools as I can. And um, we, we found a fantastic um, mill that's still making British denim. It's the only place that's making British denim. And so for me, it is, it's actually probably looking back at traditional methods rather than new methods. Um, that seems to be the way I'm trying to find my way of sustainable working. Great. Um, just looking out into the room, are there many questions having been thought up or any urgent ones? We have one here. Okay, um, we will we will give you a microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Samta. Um, so I have two questions, but I won't ask both. Maybe right in the end, if you have time, you can give me a chance. But the first one is, uh, Caroline, firstly, I must say how happy I am to meet you face to face, because our time on Earth was one of the most... Uh, interesting uh, exhibitions that I saw over the summers. So, yeah, so nice to meet Thanks. you. I didn't plant you either, did I? <laughs> <laughs> We've never met. <laughs> so Thank my you. question actually is also coming from what you said right in the beginning. You spoke about how sustainability has become a problematic world, uh, word, and mostly it's met with a lot of frowns wherever you go. But I have been wondering, and I want to ask, I mean, probably the whole hall here, if there is another word that's developing in the discourse, which does communicate the sincerity that we want to have within the sustainability quest. Is there something out there? Oh, what a great question. Could talk a long time about it, but I'd probably bore everybody. But yeah, so uh, the reason sustainability is having a, a difficult time as a word, because sustainable means to maintain the status quo, right? It means to, to keep things as they are. And the problem is that the damage that humans have made on the planet is to the point that we can't maintain where, where we are. So I guess that's why this word regenerative, you know, regeneration, it seems to be the kind of zeitgeist buzzword replacement. And um, it's kind of problematic because, I, you know, I was at Dutch Design Week a couple of weeks ago and somebody was like, oh, and here's some regenerative soap. And I was thinking, really? Like, <laughs> and I think that that's the problem with these words that we kind of coalesce around is that often the meanings aren't sort of defined collectively and established or, or, or not understood. And it, it becomes this kind of catch everything word. So, but I think for me, um, one of the, the best things that I've read for a long, long time was this, and it's a bit. Um, long-winded the title but it was basically this uh, this essay by um, an environment uh, environmental academic called uh, Glenn Albrecht called um, exiting the Anthropocene and entering the symbiocene and basically um, you probably know we're in the Anthropocene the era in which humans have impacted the makeup of the planet so geologists came together and defined that we are now in the the, the era of the Anthropocene and you know we need to very quickly move out of that um, because it's, you know, we're making detrimental impact on the planet on a daily basis and climate emergency is obviously very real. So he took the, the symbiocene is termed as the next era which we need to move towards, which is taken from the Greek word of symbio, living in symbiosis of, of um, common nurturing, basically, and this, this idea of, of 
people and planet flourishing together in in the symbiocene and he talks about the, the the ways in which we need to do that and and circular is is a really important part because if you think of sustainability as maintaining the status quo but you, um circular is doing no no impact as in zero you know because you're maintaining things in closed loops and then regenerate, you know, regeneration or being regenerative as in putting back better or so, you know, materials like wood, if they're properly managed, they will grow back. And things like hemp that are, you know, very low water usage, zero pesticide, well, not zero, but lower pesticide. So there's, there's lots of um, examples of kind of regenerative materials that I think people are starting to, to move towards. So I don't have the answer in terms of what this word is, but I, d I guess one of the concerns I have that suddenly I understand that sustainability is not cracking it. Um, it's, it's the word that our clients understand, though, so we have to be careful and, and we can't say that we're enabling them to, 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 to practice regenerative practices because we're not at the moment. So we have to be really careful not to just jump to using this word and, and throwing out another word. But um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not really answering the question, but I definitely recommend that essay. So it sort of just had loads of light bulb moments for me and suddenly it seemed that this path was actually a bit clearer. We have another question on the second row there. Hi, um, I'm just reflecting on, um, I was watching on LinkedIn, uh, this uh, indigenous lady in Africa, she was being interviewed, um, she was from some tribe, and she was saying how the last 300, 400 years of colonialism, and she was saying that all that's happened for the last two or 300 years has been people have come in, they've taken the resources, and there's not been anything been given back, like for example Congo. And then you see the supply chains for the last few years getting stymied quite a lot. And when I see what the messages are from the Global South, this is saying you can take all the resources you want, but eventually that's going to come full circle um, to the point where it's going to show you how dependent you are on a country 3,000 miles away. And what are you going to be able to do to actually increase your resilience and your provenance of your products in your, in your own locale? So my question is, is that you, you spoke about the resources like hemp, and then we're talking about you know, supply chains. My question is, is um, are we in 2022, 23, are we competent enough, or are we quite a few years away from actually saying, we will not do things sustainably, but are we competent enough to actually source the materials in a local and regenerative way from our own country, rather than going to a country 3,000 miles away where they're still trying to warn us to, you know, bring in the tide a bit. Um, and, you know, hemp is a very good example, but it's, that's, that's another education in itself. So how are we competent enough to actually bring in the tide for the UK and realise that a lot of the resources, I, in my opinion, we've so lost the connection with the resources in the UK that we do look further afield. And how do you re-educate that? But also, are we competent enough to bring it back into the British Isles or whatever your region is? So, Martina, you spoke earlier about the difficulty of sourcing French <coughs> wool, for example. So maybe you could start trying to answer that extremely important question. Yeah, I think mostly products is a, is a supply chain. So, for example, the wool, a lot of British wool, amazing British wool. But there, are, there aren't many wool uh, places where you can wash wool. So if you can't wash your wool as a, as a um, shear or someone has wool, then, then you can't you know, make fleas out of it, and then they can't spin it, and, they, and, and that's, so it stops at some point. So I guess because of glo globalization, there's been, um, obviously, chains have been moved away. So if you can't make a yarn, you're not going to have, a, you're going to have a very difficult to make, to have mills. And and so you, you could change from, from hemp to wool or whatever, from hemp to some cotton to hemp, but you need that whole kind of chain. So I guess, um, there are some examples of people who are trying to get equipment, old equipment, funny enough, 
people going back to actually having to find the Victorian equipment because there isn't anything out there on the market. You know, if you want to, like a loom, a certain, certain size, you're going to be back a back hundred years at least. So, um, yeah, I think there is many, many people who are trying to locally. Um, for example, wood, I mean, it's one of them. You know, where people are trying to not only use the wood that's local to them, but also, first of all, look at the forest management and don't do not do kind of um, uh, monoculture forestation. So it would be certain woods, certain trees cut out a certain age, you know, at a particular time of the year, and they will be milled in a certain way, and so on and so on. So I think there is there is people trying things, but I think the, unfortunately, the, the price point is just, there's so much pr pressure, you know, when prices go up in material for anyone to compete with that. For example, I'm, I'm Italian, I come from the mountains, and Three years ago, there was two years ago there was a big windfall, and um, um, hectares and hectares of, of trees, forest, has just been basically fallen to the ground. But um, somehow, a lot of these trees were bought by overseas buyers because the, the wood price was so high at that point, they could just buy the wood, and there wasn't any wood left for a lot of local kind of makers. So it shows you also the power of kind of the industry that as soon as there is, is this material there, it just gets bought. The people have never seen the forest, they've never known that it's just a, you know. So yeah, so there is, um, how, do, how, do we, how do we break those chains without breaking the market as well and introducing new, new chains? Yeah. It's not going to be the same market. It won't, it won't, the market won't look the same. I mean, I, I do believe that it is possible, but that we have what we need here, but we do have to go back, as you say, to finding the old, way, old ways of working. The, the number of choice will completely be eradicated and the price will go up. So we, we are, it is possible, but it's, it's, I can't see it happening for quite a number of years. It's going to be a slow process. And all the amazing manufacturing we had, they all chucked out their machinery, you know, Wedgwood what they threw away was absolutely criminal. You know, all their molds, all their machines, all went in the bin before it went to China. So it's, it's frightening what we've lost. I would say, though, I think it's, it's definitely um, about looking backwards and reviving a connection to material. But I think we don't have to go back to kind of cottage industry because what the most... Um, I think it was an amazing question, by the way, and the way you framed it was uh, really incredible. And I think it's about combining the technology that we have with the, the, the craft history that we have. So, for example, the most... The answer to, my, to your question in my head is, is in, an, in an example that we were lucky enough to collaborate with an architectural studio called Buildex. Uh, they're based in Nairobi in Kenya. And basically, they're all about local materials but being globally connected. So benefiting from, and it's, so I don't know if you've heard of the Fab City movement, which is all about being locally productive, but globally connected. So utilizing technology um, and sharing skills um, th through global networks, because we're not going to go back to just being completely, um, you know, individual cities and countries. We, we have technology that connects us in incredible ways. So what they were doing is responding to a, a Kenyan housing crisis and, and building... Uh, low cost, high quality housing using globalized technology, so digital fabrication, but with three materials with mycelium, with uh, compressed stabilized earth blocks, and uh, cross laminated timber. So, wood, basically, mushroom, and earth. The earth was excavated from the local sites. The um, wood is ideally from sustainably managed forests nearby, and the mycelium can be grown anywhere. And I think it sort of goes back to something that Faye was talking about, that we actually need to change our perception of materials, because what that was showing was local variation. So we were showing it in the Our Time on Earth exhibition that these compressed, stabilised earth blocks, they're going to look different depending on where you source them from. They're going to have different colours. The myceliums can be grown in multiple different... Uh, you know, can ha develop different properties, different densities, etc. So it's about sort of embracing that variation of the localised opportunity, but benefiting from, from the global knowledge. So I feel very positive about that. And I think that, that example summarises it for me. Um, just very 
quickly, um, because the, the gentleman, men, you, you mentioned Italy, that's where your roots are. One of my friends, she's in, uh, is there, I think it's Torino. Um, so she said that the company they work for, they used to source the material from China and 2020 was the first year where they're going to grow it in Torino. They're going to manufacture it, the consumption and the recycling. And she says to me, up until all this time, we've been developing our model, and you'd be surprised, um, she told me, Saga, the amount of threatening letters that we're getting from big international companies saying, stop doing this, because you're doing everything within Torino, even the consumer in recycling. So companies like Nike, Adidas, they're looking at that, thinking not to learn from them, but to actually say, move out the way, stop what you're doing. And this is just an example that things are going to happen where you've got the big boys actually going to try and stop the small local guys who are contributing to the local economy being told to stop what they're doing because it's actually what we really need, but it's not what they really want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any replies to that, or should we see if there's another question? Hopefully someone's going to call them out yeah. <laughs> and use the power of social media to get it stopped. Um, we will have to round off the session very soon, but if there are any final questions from the audience, happy to take one more. Thank you. Hello. Um, something that does concern me, I was shocked to read in, in a reference thing that there are now 8, million, 8 billion homo sapiens. We just passed that uh, measure. And just looking back in... I was born in 1948, and when the population of the world was two and a half billion. Now, if that, we carry on on that trajectory, I think we are into real big problems, however much recycling, reuse, or whatever we do. There are effectively just too many people. Do you have any suggestion as to how we overcome that? <laughs> Yeah, too, too, we could start with designers. There's too many designers then. Let's start with them. You can take away some of us. Yeah, no. Um. Unless we all start... I remember, it wasn't it, um, Maurizio Montalti said that his, his whole design practice is, is about getting rid of stuff. Like, and I just really like that idea that um, rather than making more, that it was about designing systems to get rid of what we have or to, or to you know, in, in, a, in a harmless way. I mean... I, I, somebody else quoted that 8 billion number. That makes me feel really nice. <laughs> it, make, it makes me feel like... Um, I, like how, it sounds really pathetic, but like how much care could we all give each other? Like, could we... I, I guess when I was th looking at um, both of your work, I was thinking, oh, it's just so that it sort of exudes care and even the materiality of it and and you can see your hand in it and I think that's some of the problem that we've lost that sort of nurturing and that care um so I guess it's half empty half full right I mean there's a whole lot of us to solve the mess that we're in I guess one one thing is uh, is you know as you said before can we all continue living as as before I guess eight million living in a certain way could be the same as four million living another way, you know. So it's it's if we if we live as no day, no tomorrow, um, three million might be too many. So I think it means yeah, less of everything. I mean that's just that's just the fact that we all have to. We all need need to make adjustments. And need to make adjustments yeah. uh, and it's difficult because uh, in a way our economic model is opposite, the opposite. It's you know it's so it's. Um, we will see, but it's interesting to see what happened in the pandemic when there was zero almost in certain certain businesses, and of course there was a lot of money being printed and a lot of kind of bailouts. But at the same time, also you wondered that model, that, that idea that everything has to grow, didn't really stand up anymore because there wasn't any growth. There was you know negative growth. Yeah. So okay. you actually think actually I've been being fooled for something here that this growth is. Constant growth is uh, it just kind of made up in a way to of greed, rather than I don't know the reality seemed different to me, looking at post pandemic. Yeah, and I, I think we are conditioned now to think about newness, all of us on whatever level it is. You know, from 
from producing anything to launching anything to, you know, we're constantly now, as human beings, set up for newness and change. And, and I think that, that, is, that is a problem, you know, because we really need to, we do need to stand still. We've been given a message, clearly, and we did stand still for a bit. But we, I think, I already feel it, that the world and the demands are pulling us back towards newness and change because we feel refreshed by it. But do we need as much of it? Probably not. And restriction, I think, was a word maybe that you used earlier, that I think that's... That's the reality that, you know, within the climate emergency narrative, there's a lot of conversation about grief and not just about grief in terms of biodiversity loss, but grief of that we have to get used to that is going to be a radically different lifestyle. We, you know, we're making, you know, decisions now that are going to massively impact our... Well, or not making decisions now and, in, in, you know, political inactivity. So I think getting used to different lifestyles and how do we do that is really important. I also like the fact that within a talk that's about material narratives, we've gone from speaking about the material to talking about decolonization to potential overpopulation. It's clearly at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, materials are at the key, I think, of the solutions as well. And I think that what you've been talking about today gives us a little bit of a hint of that. And I think that with that, we can all take that away with us and consider our own situation and our own position within this field of material narratives. We all have something to input and we have all something to take away. So I really thank the three of you for uh, providing such exciting and thought-provoking uh, debate and conversation on a Monday afternoon. Thank you, uh, Caroline, Martino and Faye. And thank you all of you for coming and for the brilliant questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you.